Hello, and welcome back to Slate Money. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios. I'm here with Emily Peck of Axios. Hi. Oh my God, is this a special edition or what? Anna Shemansky, welcome back. Hello. It's so good to have you back. Um, For those listeners who haven't been with us for a couple of years, introduce yourself. Who are you? So my name is Anna Shemansky. I was on Slate Money for about four years. Wow. Hard to believe. Um, So when I left Slate, I went back to working at Oak Tree Capital, where I had actually worked at before. So I am currently the senior financial writer at Oak Tree Capital. I run our insights program. Um, I also previously was working as a journalist at uh, Reuters Breaking Views before I came back to Oak Tree. Welcome, Anna. And um, you're going to plug your new podcast later in the show. But we, you have two podcasts now at Oak Tree, yes. one with Howard Marks, one with the re- everyone else. Yes. And so go subscribe to them. We are going to talk to you about credit and private equity and whether people might be rotating from stocks into bonds and mostly about your favorite subject in the world, college sports. Super interesting. Can't wait to get into it. It's all coming up on Slate Money. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I know you need this medicine, but it looks like it's not covered by your insurance. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to deny that one. Wait, who are you? I'm your insurance company's pharmacy benefit manager. I get paid based on the price of a medicine, and I don't make as much money off this one. No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. Blazing deals, boundless options. It's Hot Grill Summer at Whole Foods Market from June 14th through July 4th. Fire up the grill with quality cuts at the best prices. We're talking animal welfare certified meat. Check out the sales on bone-in ribeye, beef kebabs, and New York strip steak. Round out your barbecue with plant-based proteins, sliced cheese, soft buns, and all the condiments. Plus, sales on fresh strawberries, peaches, and more. Don't forget the pie, either. Get grilling at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. Anna, you you work at a major credit shop, and we're going to get nerdy about credit, but really, you've come in here wearing a college sports hoodie, and I know what you really want to talk about is college sports. That is very true. Okay. So uh, you, you have two perfect interlocutors here, because I feel like Emily and I, between us, could probably fill a postage stamp with what we know about college sports. Yeah, okay, that's true. I mean, I don't like to associate with you and like say that I know just as little about sports as Felix, but <laughs> it's probably true. Um, but I have a overarching theory of of college sports at least until 2 years ago and possibly even until today, which is that they are especially when it comes to men's football are incredibly profitable organizations that TV companies pay billions of dollars for, that pay millions of dollars to coaches, that subsidize universities to the tunes of millions of dollars, and that the people providing the incredibly valuable labor, which is which is ultimately responsible for all of those millions of dollars, don't get paid, and that this is deeply unfair, and that at some point, somehow, they're going to have to start getting paid. Um, and we took a small move in that direction two years ago? So, yes. Um, roughly two years ago, there was uh, the NCAA essentially said that athletes could now make money off of their name, image, or likeness. So let me take a step back here just to kind of set the stage. Because, Felix, what you explained there are certain things that are true about what you said. The thing that I'll say is not actually true is that most um, sports programs, including football and basketball, are not actually profitable. They're actually subsidized by the university. They're not necessarily subsidizing the university. There are a small number that are profitable. So when you say most sports programs, you mean not only most sports, but even most programs within, say, football. And Correct. Football, even within men's football. Correct. Right. It's very, okay. very expensive to run. Why is it so expensive? 
Well, a lot of it actually is the scholarships for the players. Oh, so it's like an opportunity cost. If you weren't, if you weren't recruiting, no, I mean it's money. You you are as anyone who has debt, college debt knows that is that is actual money. And when you have one part of the university that is essentially giving scholarships, that has to be accounted for. Um, okay, so in little, so in a way, if you're getting a, a free scholarship to a college that would otherwise cost you thirty thousand dollars a year, then that then you're kind of being paid thirty thousand dollars a year. Yeah, time. I mean that's the interesting thing when it comes to college sports. So. Basically going back like, you know, 100 years, essentially, when college sports first start, for the most of the history of college sports, the model made sense because basically they were almost like club sports. You were going to school. You were paying us. You were playing a sport at a certain point that playing that sport allowed you to go to college for free. So that is money, essentially, that you are getting paid. And again, for vast history of college sports, there wasn't an insane amount of money in those sports. And so that that made sense. Then that started to change. And it really changed for two sports. Again, college football, college basketball. For the vast majority of sports, it is still true that the value of the scholarship and the room and board and everything else that you get is way more than the value that the monetary value that you'd be bringing to the university. However, for these other sports, that has started to change. One of the main reasons it started to change were because of media contracts. And Felix, as you mentioned, especially in recent years, you've seen these massive media contracts, including with the Big Ten, one of the conferences, which had, I was think it was roughly eight, between eight and nine billion dollar TV contract. And I'm assuming that it's called the Big Ten because there were 10 schools. <laughs> You'd think, right? There I mean, I'm just trying to work out if that's like a billion dollars per school. There. <laughs> so there used to be 10 schools up until the early 90s, and then Penn State joined, and there were 11 schools. And then years later, you had another three schools joined. Um, and then now you're actually going to have UCLA and USC joining. So you will have 16 teams in the so Big Ten. So a mere half a billion dollars per school. Yeah, oh, exactly. Chump change. Exactly. Um, so... Over the years, as schools were making more money off of these programs, as these TV contracts were getting bigger, and also as you were having all these licensing deals. So you were having jerseys with athletes' names on them. You were having video games with the athletes in them. And the athletes weren't getting money from that. And so I think fairly reasonably, you had a number of athletes getting upset about that because even though, yes, they were getting paid in the sense of there is a real value to that scholarship, as I say, for anyone who has college debt knows that there that's a real value as well as a number of other things. However, for a small percentage of athletes that are bringing a tremendous amount of value to these schools, they certainly were getting underpaid. And, and just, just so I understand one other thing, which is I've had in the back of my head for ages. Is there a convention in basketball and probably football as well that if you're a big professional team, like in the NBA or the NFL, then you only hire people who played at the college level? And so that, like, if you want to get one of those big, high paying jobs in the professional leagues, you kind of need to go through this sort of hazing ritual of spending four years not getting paid? So it's a, it's a good question. In basketball, you actually know, you have a lot of players now who go directly from high school or they play in other leagues, European leagues or the NBA's kind of minor league, the G League, so that they can get paid and then they can go straight to pros. In football, you actually do have a restriction. Uh, it's, It's basically the number of years outside of high school that you have to be before you can play. And partly it would be very, very challenging for a 18-year-old or a 19-year-old to play professional football simply for the size of the men. There is a large difference between a 18, 19-year-old and like a 22-year-old when you're talking about football players. So while I kind of am a believer that they should just open it up and say, if you want to try, go to it. If you're a kicker, hey, I don't know, maybe you can make it. There are some reasons why you've had those rules. Although I agree with you, I'm not a huge fan of some of those particular rules. But Again, over the years, you had this kind of brewing discontent. And then you started to have a number of states that were starting to change some laws, saying that, like, we don't agree with what the NCAA is saying. We think players should be able to get money off of their name, image, and likeness. So just to back up, the NCAA is what exactly? (laughs) That is a good question. The NCAA (laughs) is a useless institution is what the NCAA (laughs) is. Technically, the NCAA, like, manages all college sports. There are different divisions of college sports. 
and money flows through the NCAA. So when when there's like a a TV deal for the Pac-10 or whatever you called it, like that is going via the NCAA to the schools? It depends, actually. Sometimes it just goes through the conferences. I I say this because the NCAA has become increasingly less important as an institution. Basically, what's happened is that the conferences and then these other entities like the college football playoffs, which is just a separate entity, have gained more and more power. And what the NCAA has really become is essentially a rule organization that tells people, you know, This coach bought this player a hot dog, so we're going to find them. Like, literally silly things like that. I mean, that's a slightly exaggerated example, but not much so. And they do this because what? What are their incentives? So the NCAA obviously is making money off of all of these sports that are going on. And, And like licensing fees and stuff. Yeah. And and the most money they make is actually through the NCAA basketball tournament because that money does go through the NCAA. And that is, as everyone knows, who you work even people who don't know college sports often know the NCAA tournament because you do the brackets and everybody bets in it. You know, so. it, right? March Madness, the brackets. Oh, right. That's the thing with Sweet 16, which I always exactly. thought was really strange. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. I was, like, I was like, there was this women's tournament when they called it the Sweet 16. I'm like, that's so sexist. And then everyone was like, no, they do that for the men <laughs> like, as well. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And actually, the women's tournament was way better than the men's tournament this year. Side note, in basketball. Um, so, Both the schools and the NCAA have very much wanted to keep these athletes listed as student athletes and not as employees, because if they were employees, then you would conceivably have to pay them. And that gets so challenging when you start to make the math work for that. And the reason goes back to what I said at the beginning. There are only essentially two sports that make money. And even within those sports, there's only a small number of programs that really make money. Schools have a tremendous number of athletes. The vast majority of them, obviously, are not making, they're not bringing more money in that offsets the value of their scholarship. So then it becomes, how do you pay these players? And then on top of that, if you're talking about an academic institution, you have Title IX rules. So then it becomes, well, you're going to pay the men and not pay the women? Well, you can't do that. But then how does that math start to work? And so that's part of the issue is that basically college sports has this problem where Most of college sports are basically kind of like club sports. And then you basically have these enormous professional entities latched on. And you really can't make rules that work for one that work well for the other. And that's part of the problem. So, okay, so the NIL name image likeness Mm -hmm. thing happened two years ago. What's the impact been? So actually, it's been just incredibly interesting to me, both as someone who likes sports and as someone who likes economics, because it's been really interesting to see what happens when you basically start to open up a market where you are capping prices. What NIL was supposed to do was enable a player to like do an advertisement and get money from that. But what it's actually done is it's created these collectives. So these are not parts of the school. They are basically boosters. So it's like wealthy alumni who want to give money to certain players so that they will come and play at the school. So what they do is they'll say like, oh, well, they're going to go do this two signings and we're going to pay them $600,000 or something like that. So, but basically you're giving players money. Is So so, so there's like quasi-formal groups who are generally alumni of the school but are not officially the school and they basically quietly go up to various 17 18 year olds and say here's a massive check if you join this school rather than anyone else there's really no disclosure about exactly who's doing what and how much money and the the rules are essentially non-existent the ncaa i think in a lot of ways has just kind of thrown up its hands and been like whatever you figure it out and But what I think has been very interesting to see is that, as I said at the beginning, when you're talking about whether players are being underpaid or not versus the value of their scholarship, to me, that was maybe an academic question before. Now it's not, because the fact that you're seeing more money going to them shows that, no, actually, for a certain number of players, clearly there is a higher value. And that's why they're being paid that. That market is showing that. Because before, also what you had is you had a black market before, and everyone knew it, which was that you also had players getting money, but it was... You know, it was illegal. It was a violation. Now that's changing. And so 
the other interesting thing that has happened at the same time, which impacts this, is that you've had change in transfer rules. So it used to be that players, if they played at one school, it was very difficult to transfer to another school. They'd have to sit out for at least a year or more. And so what that meant is that certain schools could kind of like hoard talent. But then that rule changed also. So now it's really easy to transfer. And why that matters with this NIL thing is what then is happening is not only are you having collectives go to, you know, a 17, 18 year old and saying, here's, you know, here's a bag of money. I want you to play at Texas A&M. You're basically also having teams be able to go to other teams' players and say, well, we want you to transfer here and then we'll give you money. Now, technically, they're not allowed to talk to other teams' players until the team, the person puts themselves into the transfer portal. But The transfer it's called portal? The, oh, my God. The terms are amazing. They're just, they're unbelievable. I feel like, do you remember portals in like the late 90s when everyone thought that the internet would be based on portals and, and people called like Excite and Alta Vista? It sounds like and Star Trek. Yahoo are called portals. No, I don't remember that. I, I'm just thinking about Star Trek. That's it. <laughs> that's all I have. But yeah, so that's the so then you're now seeing this other thing where you're literally having players moving in between schools. It's essentially like total free agency and Basically, everyone in terms of coaches and administration are like losing their minds because it is very challenging. And to me, the issue is that, again, it goes back to that idea. You have a professional organization that you have latched on to a non-professional organization. And you're trying to make those two things work. What they ultimately need is to acknowledge that these players are, in fact, employees. And then you can have contracts and things could be a bit more stable. But in order to do that, you would then be having to pay all these other players who aren't bringing in money from other sports. And how do you make that work? Aren't there there are cases also? There's like an NLRB there's a case, million cases, and l- yeah. litigation there's where some athletes are trying to be classified as, exactly. as workers. Exactly. And you also have a lot of different law, like different um, legislators that are trying to push through different rules to establish that. And I think the fact that you're going to get, like, I think it's unlikely that you're going to get some type of national rule. I think this is just going to be a little bit of a mess for a while, to be perfectly honest. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high yield savings account that's built right into the wallet app. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Wondery, which makes a podcast called Business Wars. Business Wars come in all manner of shapes and sizes. For instance, in this season, there's Hagen does this is Ben and Jerry's. Think going back to 1983 when Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield need to withdraw their remaining cash before the sheriff seizes it. Or think 2010 for another business war. The fast fashion wars of brands like Zara and Forever 21, which got caught up in all manner of scandal when there was a series of deadly tragedies at factories in Bangladesh. Hosted by David Brown, Business Wars is an award-winning podcast that tells the stories of some of the greatest business feuds of our time. So follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts or listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. For me, it seems to me that universities have a lot of employees. You know, they have teaching assistants and they have adjuncts and they have janitorial staffs and they have like a whole bunch of people who they don't pay particularly well, but they do pay. And that seems to work out okay for them. And if they ended up having to pay a relatively small amount of money to like the swim team or whatever, like how bad is that? And then you know, and then that would at least create that structure that would allow the more professional parts of the college sports world to exist. And yeah, and then universities could basically choose, you know, do we want to be one of those universities that does the college sports thing and pays our athletes because they're workers? Or do we not? And then, you, you know, you if you want to be a college athlete, you go to one of the colleges that does. And if you don't, then you don't. I do 
agree that I think you're going to start to have universities making very distinct choices about how their programs are structured. And But I would say it's not as simple as saying, well, we'll just pay everybody a little bit, partly because even if you do that, if you're still also doing scholarships, it is very tough to well, make maybe, that Well, maybe, well, that makes it even better, right? If you start paying the athletes, then maybe you don't need to do the scholarships, and then that that stops the weird admissions crap around scholarships, which would also be a virtue. It would not be a virtue if you're a student athlete for the vast majority of student athletes. This is the issue. What I think is going to end up happening is, in my opinion, is that you're probably going to see most sports be, like, relegated to, like, essentially not varsity, but almost like a club level, because it just simply will not make economic sense to have them. And then you will have these very large revenue generating sports. And what's that, what that means is that for a lot of student athletes who, a lot of students who are able to go through school because they were athletes, they're probably not going to have that opportunity. But not, wait, just just so I'm clear about this, not all student athletes are on scholarships, no. right? Just if I'm, if I'm on the university swim team, that doesn't mean ipso facto that I'm getting a full scholarship. Not necessarily, but a lot of them do. So, no, but the point being that, like, at that point, uh, the universities are already calibrating. Some students they're giving scholarships to, sc- some students they're not. Some students they're giving, like, partial scholarships to, some they're giving full scholarships to. We're already seeing that kind of calibration. All they need to do at that point, if they start paying students, you know, minimum wage on, you know, for starters to be part of the team, if, the, if you're on the team, then that you, you just kind of take that off the other end in, ter- in terms of the scholarships that you're off- offering. Like, I don't see how that's such a bad outcome. I would say that it it will be a better outcome for a small number of players and a worse outcome for a large number. But it would also be a better but it would be a better outcome for all of the student athletes who are currently not getting any scholarships. Well, if they're not getting any scholarships, it wouldn't really impact them. Well, they would get start getting paid and they'd have labor aids. Well, the ones who aren't who don't have scholarships are not going to be the ones who are going to be getting paid. The ones thought, who are getting thought, paid thought, are the ones who are going to also have scholarships. No, but I'm saying, like, they were, isn't the idea that if you're on the team, then you get paid? That's the whole point. You're an employee. So, like, yeah, you, you are getting paid. Even if you're just, like, on the swim team, you get paid. You don't get paid very much, but you get paid something, and that's better than nothing, which you get if you don't have a scholarship. The other issue this brings up is if you go back to, okay, well, we're going to take a set of these athletes, and we're just all going to pay them the same thing, and they'll get paid a little bit, and that's fine. And you can say, well, are you also going to give them a scholarship or are you just going to pay them? Okay, well, that's another question. Now, the issue becomes, if I'm a star quarterback, should I get paid the same as the third string kicker? No, I mean, at that point, yeah, like on all sports teams, the stars get paid more than the third But can kicker. you do that in an academic institution? That becomes tricky. I'm not saying you can't do it, but it becomes, it becomes very tricky. And then if you don't perform well, then does that mean you get paid less. This also is very different than how the current system works. The it's I'm not saying that you can't figure out a system that works, but it's going to be, have to be tremendously different than the current system. Well, when you say the current system, do you mean the system that includes all of these weird clubs or the system like pre-2021 that didn't have the clubs? The, 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 the donor, the alumni clubs? The collectives. Collect- collectives, that's it. Yes. So the previous system... I think for the vast majority of athletes, frankly, worked well, and then for a small percentage, worked very, very poorly. I think what eventually is going to happen is that for that small number of athletes, things will work a lot better because they're probably going to end up in a system where they can make a lot of money off of name, image, and likeness and also be getting paid. And then for a large number of athletes, they're probably going to be in a worse position, to be perfectly honest. However, And, and, And just to be clear, what we're doing here is... Con- is, is we use we, we've basically created a loophole, which is that in most sports, in professional sports, you have a contract with your team which pays you a certain amount of money, and then over and above that, you you know appear on TV ads and you get other money for that. And it's and if you look at lists of high paid athletes, they, it's always very very clear how much money they get for actually committing athletics and doing sport, and then how much they get for other stuff. In in this case, it seems that what you're saying, Anna, is that we're going to move to a world where technically the amount of money that you're getting paid for doing sport is 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 classed as this, you know, publicity rights kind of payment because there's no sort of legal mechanism to 
pay people for doing sports. But that loophole is going to at least allow the elite of the spectator sports to finally start getting paid. Right. And that's what you're seeing with NIL is basically that the elite athletes are some of them making quite a bit of money, it's like young kids making quite a bit of money, as I frankly think they should be. <laughs> um, but that's not the vast majority of athletes, just a small number. But I actually think, frankly, that that makes sense. That is value that they are bringing. And, they, and the fact that now that when you open up the market, you see that shows you that that value really is there. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens moving forward because anyone who watches college sports knows that most players don't work out. So I think that's going to become another interesting side of when... Work out as in like go professional and be successful professionals? Or do well even on the college level. So that because it's an interesting... Because right now, again, this is all very murky in terms of the collective. So it's like... You're giving money, but then if the team doesn't actually do well, are you still going to continue to give money? And it's this is when we're in this like gray area, it just makes things really interesting and complicated. But Anna, they're not just making money from the collectives, right? I mean, they are signing deals. They are promoting products. They're like doing influencer stuff. Um, And like the really um, did you hear that? Did you hear that Livy rizzed up baby gronk? I don't know what those words mean. (laughs) I'm just going to ignore it. Um. They, they're like the, some of them are like influencers and they're really like actively trying to make money. Oh, yeah. No. And I, as I said, like I actually think a lot of these changes ultimately are good. I think the fact that you couldn't make money off of your name, image and likeness before was insane. Yeah. Right. And, and because now you also do have athletes. The name, image and likeness thing, I think, also potentially could help some of the non-revenue generating sports where you could have someone who is an athlete at a well-known school and thus can become an influencer and make money in a sport that they wouldn't be able to make money potential. And, and so Libby, that's good. So Libby I, yeah. is actually, I mean, Please these, explain. I'm these sorry. Are just, no, these are just words. And like, literally, you do not want to know what it means. Um, but put to one side what, you know, rising up is um, the um, interesting part of that sentence, which is impossible to see from the outside, is this thing called Livy. Livy is actually a student athlete. She's a gymnast. She she does gymnastics. And she is huge on TikTok and Instagram and that kind of stuff. And she makes a lot of money doing that. And I'm going to come out and say that that would have been highly problematic two years ago. And now now she's going out and making money from being awesome on the socials and, like, good for her. No, I completely agree. So the name, image, and likeness thing, that's, that's probably working out fine. The collective thing, that's dodgy, that's sketchy. Beyond that, there's this question of... No, the collective thing, I kind of like it. It's a nice little way around, like, because you have all of these bizarre artificial constraints about being employees and stuff, it's a nice way of doing an an end run around those constraints and allowing the kids to get paid. Okay. And then the third thing that's more hard and case by case is deeming these athletes employees and figuring out how to do that. That, that doesn't need to happen necessarily. You could just like Oh my god, it. Emily Peck. I was like, you of all people would be like, these people are employees, they need to get paid. Well, I mean, what Anna's saying is true though. Most of the student athletes aren't like these big stars sure. that bring in lots of revenue to the school and if most of them are getting scholarships, then that seems like yeah, a fine. Yeah, like, that's the thing I don't know. It's like if you go outside the big football and a basketball, a lot of them are getting scholarships. Yeah. Like what percentage of those athletes are on scholarships? Because I feel like it's a bit, you know, it feels a little bit almost unfair to everyone else if you just go to college and you want to play a sport and then you're like oh sorry we've recruited all of these uh, you know elite athletes with scholarships and therefore you can't play the sport because reasons like that feels unfair you to the play people at a club who, team what's the club team just something that's below varsity so i mean you can still play a sport yeah and i and as i've said I, I honestly think some of these sports might end up getting relegated if you did shift to some type of employee oh, model. so there are two levels and you could there make a ma- distinction between those levels yeah there are at universities there are lots of different when, when people talk about playing sports at university they're talking about playing at kind of varsity level but yeah at universities you either some already do have some type of club level or you could simply honestly like relegate certain sports to that to try to get around the system but i think i kind of agree with emily that currently i think it probably i think it makes some sense to stay in the current model because i think it ultimately does allow the players who really are bringing in tremendous amount more value to get money for that while also allowing 
this other system to work for a lot of people. However, it's I don't know how long it can possibly continue just because it is creating so much like chaos in the sport. And these are sports with lots of money in them. And you have a lot of people with a lot of power who care about this. And so they want to create rules to, frankly, restrict the power of labor because they don't like the fact that now these players can play these teams off of each other and get a bigger, a better deal. So it, it'll be interesting for me to see how long this intermediate step stands before you do shift into something else. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I know you need this medicine, but it looks like it's not covered by your insurance. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to deny that one. Wait, who are you? I'm your insurance company's pharmacy benefit manager. I get paid based on the price of a medicine, and I don't make as much money off this one. No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. This episode of Slate Money is brought to you by Factor. It's summertime. You are probably looking for wholesome, convenient meals for your sunny and active days. You're out and about all day, and you probably don't want to be spending half an hour chopping things and warming up ovens and frying pans. Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, and it can help you fuel up fast with flavorful and nutritious ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. No shopping, even at supermarkets. You'll save time, you'll eat well, and you'll stay on track reaching your goals. Just pick out the one you want, throw it in the microwave. You have never made a delicious meal more quickly. If I can do it, you can do it. If you want calorie-conscious options this summer, then there are dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. The Factor meals just sit in your fridge and you can see what they are on the side. You don't even need to take them out to look at them. You can pick out the one you want. Just simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. It really is the easiest thing in the world. You take the meal you put it in the microwave it is delicious it is instant there is no cooking involved this is not a meal kit this is a whole meal made for you head to factormeals.com slash slate money 50 and use code slate money 50 to get 50 percent off your first box that's code slate money 50 at factormeals.com slash slate money 50 Get 50% off your first box. At FedEx Office, we know running a business is a marathon. But sometimes, every task feels like a sprint. Design the product catalog, pick up the new boxes, print the business cards, notarize the lease, put out 20 more yard signs. It's a lot. Luckily for you, FedEx Office is here to help turn your ideas into reality. So you can stop running yourself in circles and start concentrating on the important things, like deciding what's for lunch. Visit your nearest location or office.fedex.com to get started. FedEx Office. We're going to move on to credit because I know that we can talk about sports all week, but um, we have Anna Shemansky of Oak Tree here, and we need to talk to you about credit, which is something we don't talk enough about on this show. Obviously, um, we talk a lot about interest rates and the way that, you know, bond prices have fallen when interest rates went up and that caused a banking crisis and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. But there's something else which I feel like has kind of been missing for almost 15 years now, which is credit, which is if you lend money to someone, they might not pay it back and default risk and that kind of thing. And every time everyone you know, writes a research note saying, oh, no, the sky is falling. We're about, to hit, we're about to see this huge wave of defaults. Like, it never happens. But it has to happen at some point, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so before we start a conversation, can I do my shameless plug? Please. Yeah. So as Felix said, I currently work at Oak Tree Capital. I'm our senior financial writer. I run our insights program. And we have recently launched a new podcast. So since 2021, we've had a podcast with Howard Marks, where we release his audio versions of his memos. And then also I do interviews with him. Howard is great. And that podcast has done very well. 
mainly because Howard is great. <laughs> um, and now we've released a new podcast called The Insight by R2 Capital, which is going to have audio versions of our insights pieces and then also interviews with people around Oak Tree. And I'm the host. And the goal that I really have had is to try to make these actually interesting conversations, because as we all know, a lot of finance podcasts just all kind of say the same thing and don't say very much. And I feel like, okay, we have a lot of very smart people at this firm. We could actually have some interesting conversations. So that is my goal with the podcast. And and mostly this is going to be about fixed income and credit and that kind mostly, of stuff. Mostly, yeah. I mean, Oak Tree does have, we, we do have some equity components, but we are primarily known for credit. Okay. So first question. What what is the state of credit right now? We know that the rates went up a lot, um, and that caused bonds to fall just because interest rates went down. But there did spreads gap out as well. And also tell the lovely listeners what a spread is. Yes. So okay, take a step back. Um, when you're talking about credit, you're primarily talking about bonds and loans. So. Bonds tend to be fixed rate instruments. Loans tend to be floating rate instruments. Loans are senior in the capital structure. So if there is a default, loans get paid out first and then later bonds. So that is important in terms of understanding what's been happening in credit in the last year. So when Felix is talking about spreads versus yields, we've obviously seen yields rise because interest rates have risen. We have seen an increase in spreads. They have widened, but not massively. And a spread is basically the extra interest rate that you charge to make up for all of that default risk. Essentially, yeah. You And part of the reason that you could argue you haven't seen a dramatic widening of spreads in like fixed rate debt is because, frankly, the default risk has not <laughs> increased massively in fixed rate debt. So during 2020 and 2021, there was so much money flowing into the financial system. And so all of these companies refinanced. And what that meant is that they kicked out their maturities. So what that means is it, we don't have a tremendous number of maturities in the next few years. And it's very challenging to default on maturities that don't exist. So basically, everyone can basically afford to make their interest payments. The only problem happens when you actually need to pay the principal back, because the way that bonds are generally structured is you don't actually have to pay any principal back until the very end, and you have to pay it all back. And then at that point, most corporate financiers, most corporate treasurers don't actually expect to pay that money back? No, what they refinance. expect is to refinance. And so you don't really get any defaults unless you are so unlucky as to reach that refinancing point at a point when the markets are closed and then no one will lend you the money. Exactly. And it's important to know that you don't wait. Like if you have a 2027 maturity, you're not going to refinance a 2027. Like you're going to finance well before that. I, I say that to bring up the point that while right now in fixed rate debt, you may not have like expect a massive wave of defaults, you could start to get people more worried about that moving forward if interest rates don't come down. Because as Felix, as you noted, then you start to think about that refinancing risk. So I'm fascinated. You keep on saying in fixed rate because behind that, I kind of feel like you're saying floating rate might be different. Yes. So Why is floating rate different? Okay. So in 2022, like early 2022, what you really were seeing a lot in credit in was that because people assumed that interest rates were going to be rising. So actually floating rate debt loans for investors became a very popular investment because people were like, oh, well, if interest rates are going to go up, I want a floating rate instrument because then my coupon is going to increase. My interest rate that I'm getting paid is going to increase as rates go up. I'm not going to get that big hit to the value of my instrument like you would get in fixed rate debt. So everyone's kind of thinking that. And then you got to a certain point last year where people started to be like, wait a second. While yes, as an investor, I'm getting a higher coupon, that also means that the borrower has to pay a higher interest rate. And then it becomes, okay, so my interest rate risk might be less, but my credit risk is now increasing. So one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to you about all of this was there was a super interesting Bloomberg article, which we will link to, um, that talked about private equity-backed companies. And we had a whole little thing about private equity last week. Um, and one of the interesting things about private equity-backed companies is they tend to, and I'm overgeneralizing here, but they tend to be more reliant on loans 
while public companies tend to be more reliant on bonds. And as you say, loans tend to be fixed rate, tend to be floating rate rather than fixed rate. And partially as a result of this, the debt service on PE backed companies is like six times the debt service on public companies. And this is a big difference between the private equity world and the public company world, is that suddenly the private equity world is finding its companies, which were already pretty highly levered and having to pay every cent of free cash flow and interest payments, suddenly those interest payments have doubled or tripled because of it, because interest rates have gone up so much. And now that's a real default risk for those companies. Yeah. I mean, you. it obviously depends on the private equity firm and the deals that they made. But yeah, I mean, you definitely, when money was really, really cheap, when debt was really, really cheap, you definitely had a lot of deals done that I think people who maybe were a little bit more circumspect were questioning because you were putting a tremendous amount of leverage on companies. And also you were making very optimistic earnings expectations that they were borrowing based on in terms of the cash flow you were expecting them to generate to be able to pay that back. And so, and also, as you said, people were not anticipating that interest rates were going to go up. And what this Bloomberg article also mentions is people, a lot of firms also weren't hedging the interest rate risk. And you look at that now and you're like, why wouldn't you have hedged to the risk? It was very cheap then. And I think that is a very, very reasonable thing to ask. Now, I'm sure for a lot of these companies, it was like, you know, you had had 40 years of declining or very low interest rates. And so I think for a lot of firms, again, hedging is a cost. It's like it's like taking on insurance. You're, there is a cost associated with that. And so I think people just didn't assume it was something they needed to do. But in my opinion, it's the same of like talking about SVB and that idea of like just risk control. And expecting that interest rates weren't going to go up and creating a structure that becomes very vulnerable when interest rates do go up. So, I, mean, I was really surprised because private equity, you know, they're supposed to be really smart. That's what people think, at least. And the number of these companies that didn't hedge the interest rate risk in like late 2021 when, I mean, I knew interest rates were going to go up. Everybody knew interest rates were going to go up. Inflation was high. There's, you know, the, if you look back in history, the last time interest rates went up, you know, um, during the Volcker era, the same kinds of things happened then as are happening now. So it's not like this is unprecedented. We couldn't have possibly well, there, there foreseen oh, what there would have happened. There wasn't a lot of, you know, leveraged loans and private equity during the Volcker era. No, but I mean, you could have looked like most banks knew not to be like Silicon Valley Bank because there was, there was again, precedent. This isn't a confusing thing. So I was really surprised that these private equity firms kind of whiffed it. And the, so, so, the, uh, the, yeah. the cost to hedge was so cheap. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would say it depends on exactly when you're talking about, because once you started to get to the point where people really thought, yeah, interest rates really then are going to increase, costs go up. it definitely started yeah. going up. I actually have a family member who is a CFO at a company. We were having a conversation about this where she's like, man, we really should have hedged about nine months ago. <laughs> um, you know, the cost increased relatively quickly. But I, but at the end of the day, Emily, I think you're right that I think that a lot of firms should have engaged in better risk management. And I think, you know, we, this is tends to be what happens in very easy money periods that people are incentivized to take on as much debt as they can and to yeah. try to outdo the next one and the next firm. And then when things inevitably pull back, they end up in a difficult position. And it was fascinating. There's like one of the biggest bankruptcies of the year so far, and there have been a lot this year, was that healthcare company, I think Envision, is is it called? Envision? It's a healthcare company. And, you know, they filed for bankruptcy in the press release. They listed like all these reasons, challenging business environment and uh, customers. But that was the one thing they didn't mention, which would have saved them. No, I mean, like, I, I was I felt cheated that I didn't know that. Okay, but I, I have a question about all of the this whole private equity model because when we're talking about these companies, um, we we need to be very clear about which companies we're talk we're, we're talking about. Um, the private equity model is basically that the private equity company buys the operating company. Um, the operating company is where the cash flows are and where all the debt gets taken out, but ultimately it's controlled by the private equity holding company, and it's up. You know, at the end of the day, it's up to Apollo or whoever the private equity company is to determine whether the hedges get put on or not. They own it. They control it. They run it. 
And there is this broad assumption that if interest rates go up very sharply and the operating company is forced to file for bankruptcy, that is sort of ipso facto a bad thing and in hindsight was a terrible mistake on the part of the operating company. But for me, what I do is I look at it from the point of view of the private equity company that actually owns the whole thing. And obviously, if you're a big one, especially like Apollo, you have debt funds, you have equity funds. A lot of that debt is also your own money. And if you file for bankruptcy, that is really just a sort of financial engineering thing. You still, like a different arm of Apollo ends up owning the company, ends up running the company. The company itself in many cases, isn't actually particularly affected. You know, I wrote about this in the case of Instant Pot. You know, Instant Pot is a perfectly good company making Instant Pots. It's selling fewer Instant Pots than it was before, but that's fine. Sometimes it gets, makes more money, sometimes it makes less some money. And there are headlines about it filing for bankruptcy, which are true. But in terms of the employees of Instant Pot, the vendors of Instant Pot, they're largely unaffected by this. They're still getting paid in full. And it's just a question of like, oh, well, so some of the debt holders become equity holders and some of the equity holders become wiped out. That's just that's just investment. That, that's not the real world. Anna, what do you make of this? <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about any particular firms, or any particular companies. <laughs> <laughs> but I would just say that, well, yes, I think that right now a lot of what we're talking about with these defaults, especially because default rates, honestly, are still quite fairly low, we're talking more about the market's implications and the implications for investors. I would argue that it isn't accurate to say that you can't have a real world impact. It is true that the U.S. has bankruptcy laws and where companies can be restructured. So if a company's going through bankruptcy, it doesn't mean it's going through liquidation. It's just restruct- It's just rearranging its capital structure. However, like there are going to be implications to that. You know, if a company is doing that, it's it's going to affect the company itself. And if you have a number of companies defaulting, and also if they do that, that means that their cost of capital is going to increase. They are now a risk, they have, or like they were a riskier company, they just defaulted. Their ability to grow, their ability to hire, all of these things are impacted. And on top of that, there's a connection between credit and the real world. When you're talking about like public equity in the real world, like stock prices go up, stock prices go down. But when you start to have problems in the credit markets, that's a bigger impact because that is then you're having the connection of like, well, who is holding the debt and then who is holding their debt? Then you get into the banking system. It's I don't think that we're going to have some type of massive crisis because we have some PE companies defaulting. However, I don't think it's accurate to say that you are not going to have any real world impact. I mean, the whole point of this Federal Reserve hiking cycle is to have a real world impact. Of course in, it is. Impact, right? yeah. They want the lenders to be more reluctant to lend. They want the borrowers to say... They want to slow down know, economic activity. I, yeah, I, I could afford to take out a floating rate loan when the interest rate was 1% and I can't now that it's 6%. Therefore, I'm going to do less growing and less investing. That is That is the actual mechanism by which the Fed tries to bring down inflation and cool down the economy. Right. So so that's, you know, in many ways, that's a feature, not a bug, right? That the, the, the rising rates cause a reduction of economic ta- activity. And one of the sort of tributaries of influence that the Fed has is, is via this, like, edge case of defaults, right? That at the margin, if interest rates go up, you are going to have some quantum of extra defaults, and those extra defaults are going to have exactly the same effects that you you just explained. Um, but really, those effects of companies investing less, growing less, hiring less, are broadly the same, you know, in, in, in on the sort of macro level, uh, as just the effects of rising rates, right? They're, they're you know, if it's a if it's a bankruptcy caused or a rising rates caused. From an economic point of view, the effect is largely similar. They're all related. I mean, but I would argue that what the Fed is ultimately, you know, in a perfect economic model trying to do is to slow the economy without causing a recession or a serious recession. However, the concern starts to become that when you do 
start to see defaults increasing, and then that spooks people, and then that makes money even harder, then human psychology can get involved. And that's when you have that risk of something becoming a lot more serious. And so that's why the Fed in general wants to slow things, but it doesn't want to slow things so quickly that it could generate real problems. So that's why I don't think it's as simple as saying, okay, it's fine, there can't potentially be more risk, because anytime you start to see companies actually defaulting and you start to see those default rates increasing, your likelihood of having a really significant problem increases. How much of the American economy is private equity-owned companies that are levered up to the gills? I don't know the number off the top of my head. I mean, I feel like that's an important question here, right? Because most companies, like we've already discussed how public companies tend to be in the bond market, they're uh, they're issuing fixed rate debt, they're much less exposed to this kind of thing. Family-run companies, you know, often are very conservative when it comes to borrowing money. Like, it seems to be this relatively small, you know, segment of the economy that is the one that we're worried about here. I don't think it's as small as you think. And I I don't have the number off the top of my head. But it's, as I say, I don't think we're going to have some type of massive crisis, some type of absolutely, you know, devastating GFC level thing because of, you know, what we're seeing in loans. I I simply don't think that that's accurate in any way, especially partly also because of how the loan market works. But I'm just saying that I do think it is a significant risk when you're looking at whether the economy will be able to slow and either escape a recession or just have a very mild recession or the potential likelihood that you could have something more serious happen. I think you'll see pain in places. I mean, private equity companies, they own a lot. of They own healthcare providers, hospitals, nursing homes, vice media. (laughs) Um, But if they, you know, have to file for bankruptcy or if they're having trouble paying loans back, like that's bad for their employees, their consumers, and that could have, you know, individual real world impact. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, there are millions of people in America who work for private equity yeah. companies, and those people are probably getting fewer raises right now. But I think probably that's true of public companies, too. Yeah. Um, but it seems like the private equity backed companies are the ones in bigger trouble because of the yeah. floating rate issue. Um, so you could see real impact that way. But I do wonder overall, like, what the systemic risk, and we talked about this a little last week with commercial real estate, but it seems like the same kind of thing where it's kind of like Well, commercial slow. real estate Com- is commercial- the same thing yeah. where you get a lot of leverage and assets that just continue without, you know, whatever happens to the capital stack. You know, the, the, it, there's always the risk in private equity that the company will just, as, as Anna says, liquidate. But overwhelmingly it doesn't. Overwhelmingly it's just a restructuring yeah. of the capital stack. Right. So, And also with commercial real estate, it's kind of slow moving. It's like these loans take a long time and they refinance well before they're due. And like it doesn't, it just doesn't seem like it rises to the level of, of panic. No, but I think there's a bad, I think there's a place in between nothing to see here and GFC. Oh yeah, definitely. This is in between those two Yeah. And and that's what I would say. Look, I mean, I'm not a soothsayer. I have no idea exactly what is going to happen, but I do think that this is an area where it does seem that risk has built in the system and it seems more likely that you could see default rates. And one of the things, historically, bonds would tend to have higher default rates than loans. And it looks like this time that loans are probably going to have higher default rates than bonds. You've also seen lower recovery values in loans than you have historically. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in this part of the credit markets. Also, I was interested, one of the pieces you shared with us um, from Oak Tree about how like savvy investors can get can get deals right now. Like the yields on bonds are now like amazing. So if you weren't tied well, to... Well, yeah, I mean, and again, like, you know, full disclosure <laughs> and everything, but like, yeah, I mean, like that's the thing. I mean, this is where... It's like a good time. Inter- no, I mean, for a credit investor, if you're, again, full disclosure, but like, yeah, I mean, if you're a credit investor who was kind of invo- like where risk control was important to you. So when ty- when markets are really frothy, you didn't run into bad deals. And now you have the potential to invest. Like, yeah, you know, it's it's not bad at all because you can get high yields. You can get strong investor protections. So it becomes that like 
what did you do in the good times that can position yourself for the bad times? And so also, we get rid of like some of the dumb, the dumb companies of the easy money era, like you know the the pizza startup, the pizza tech startup. Yeah, but those were that's mostly gone. like VC backs and didn't have. But a lot I'm of sure debt. there's equivalence in the PE world of but, like but, dumb companies that shouldn't have gotten so much money. In terms of yeah, I mean it might be like slightly separate from PE, but in general, when you're talking about the shift from a very easy money era to an era when money's a lot more expensive, yeah, you're not going to see as much money flowing to slightly stupid things. Right. Okay, Although, so, and then you'd also, just to, sorry, you, the stupid things won't get funded, but maybe more of the innovative things also. Well, yeah. I mean, like, that's why, sorry, the last thing I'll say, but, like, that's where there's always that question between how economies work and whether it's always bad when money is flowing to speculative parts of the economy. Well, and it's, never, it's, it's good. Lots no, of, lots I, and, and of wonderful I, things, things and, happen when that happens. And I agree with that. It's like, yeah, at the end of the day, you're usually going to have some people who will lose their investment. However, society will probably overall end up being better if, off. Because, exactly. If speculative, I mean, Dan Gross wrote a good, the, the former slate Moneybox columnist, Dan Gross wrote a whole book called Pop about exactly this, about how speculative investment all of that money that gets lost is still money that got spent on, you know, R&D and people and humans and infrastructure yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But very quickly for a little segment to put in at the end, the third segment here, I want to just take Emily's line of thought to its logical conclusion, which is putting aside the what's good for companies, putting aside whether people are going to lose their jobs, what's going to happen to the economy, just on an investment point of view, because we don't talk about investing very much. Um, on this show. We have already seen a lot of money move from cash to fixed income bonds, money market funds, treasury bonds, you know, that kind of thing, because suddenly you have you had money which was earning zero and now you can earn 5%. So why wouldn't you do that? At the same time, there's a lot of people who were invested in the stock market just because there was no way of making money in mm -hmm. the bond market. And bonds weren't yielding anything. So if you wanted to grow your money, you really had no choice but to be in stocks. Mm -hmm. So are we now entering a world where we can foresee a significant rotation out of equities and into bonds because equities feel very risky right now and bonds look like they're actually quite attractive and high yielding? Yeah. I mean, like, especially if you're looking at that fixed rate part of the market where, you know, you can get a contractual yield of eight and a half, nine percent in a market where, again, if you're talking about fixed rate, where actually the quality of the market has improved. So if you look at the percentage of the high yield market, that is double B, so the highest rating, it's the highest it's ever been. The percentage that's triple C, the lowest rating is the lowest it's ever been. So you're getting higher yields for better quality. So yeah, I, I personally do think that especially if you see interest rates not coming down the way people, still some investors think they will. So again, I don't know what's going to happen with interest rates. Nobody does. But but you can lock in those high yields now oh, yeah, yeah, regardless yeah. No, of I, what I'm talking about rates. more like, yeah, right now, I think yeah. certainly I think you could see a rotation. I'm more talking about could this be a longer term trend? And then that really becomes a question of what we see happen with rates because I think there are a number of people who do think that we may actually be entering like a newer era where, yeah, you may have interest rates coming down a little bit at some point, but not coming down to zero, not coming down to 1%, staying where, because right now, frankly, even though it seems elevated, it's really more normal historically. So what does that mean moving forward? That means a very different financial world than most people who have worked in finance for the last 40 years have gotten very used to. Let's have a numbers round. Um, Emily. Yes, it's five. Five. Mm -hmm. The number of men who perished this week on the submersible, the Titan, a story I became obsessed with like most Americans and didn't notice Apparently any other news. it was news. all over the telly. It was everywhere and it was hard not to pay attention. And I think it's interesting and relevant for Slate Money because – so apparently – and this is because I listened to a great episode of The Daily on the Titan, the submersible, because like I said, I became obsessed with this like most Americans who couldn't be obsessed with this. I, I was not obsessed with it. I'm what? not going to lie. I wasn't really obsessed with it. <laughs> it was a busy week at work. Sorry. Oh, my God. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> 
I mean, five people lost at sea, I, yeah, going to see like the biggest sad. shipwreck of the 20th century. I mean, anyway, the the reason I thought it was interesting for a Slate Money perspective is because this is like a private industry, right? These people pay like a, a quarter million dollars or something to go down in this submersible. But apparently this is a huge industry. It's not just going to see the Titanic. It's going to see all these other going on these other dives to see stuff under the sea, which is like a whole other world that's like underexplored. And the money that these like disaster tourists or these undersea tourists pay funds like scientists who go down in the submersibles too and do research. So it's kind of like this it's interesting... It's a cross-subsidy. Yeah, it's like a cross-subsidy. And now that there has been this awful, horrible accident, yeah. um, maybe that is tamped down for a while. It, it is true that even I wrote something about this, if you read my newsletter yes, this week. Yes, there you go. Um, there's this, one, one of the five men who died was this Englishman named Hamish Harding. and Was he a billionaire, Felix? Very good question. He, um, he wasn't. But roughly one in three news articles about him over the, since June 19 has described him as a, as a billionaire. There's this, Billionaire now seems to have a new meaning, which is anyone who can afford $250,000 to go look at the Titanic Titanic is sort of therefore a billionaire. And it's fascinating to watch the meaning of that word evolve. Yes. And also, I didn't appreciate the coverage that was like, they're billionaires, therefore who cares right, if they humans. perish? In a <laughs> like, what? Like, yeah, no, I, I, I'm usually not the one, first one person them, running out was. to defend billionaires but or millionaires. There, there, but I was there, like, in this case, yes. I think there was one legit billionaire, but the other four were not. But yeah, all humans. I mean, I granted, as I said, I, sorry, I did not follow the story very closely. <laughs> but... Yes, it is sad when human beings die. Yeah, of course. And of course, you should devote some resources to finding them. And I stand by this. Yeah. Um, my number is $527.68. Uh, Anna, Emily, are you guys familiar with Lunch with the FT? Of course. Yes. Okay. So Lunch with the FT, um, Anna, you want to explain to me what Lunch with the FT is? So it's uh, basically a series is in the FT where one of the reporters goes to lunch with someone and does an interview. And they always list like the restaurant they went to and the prices of what they ordered. And the conceit is that the subject gets to choose where the lunch is being held and then the FT pays the bill. And there's lots of ways this has been undermined over the years, but it's a beloved feature in the FT. And if you look at how the subjects choose the restaurant, there's always this weird sort of flex they do where they go somewhere like modest and they um, they like, oh, I, I really love this place, but, you know, they only serve sandwiches and you're not going to be able to spend more than 20 bucks, you know, that, that kind of thing, especially when it's like a billionaire or someone like that. But when... In the world of actual humans, if someone came up to you and said, you can go to lunch anywhere you like, eat anything you like, drink anything you like, and someone else is going to pay, the impulse is to be like, oh, my God, I'm going to go somewhere I could never normally afford, and I'm just going to get the FT to pay for it. And this week, we have Litquidity, the um, anonymous Instagrammer and tweeter, getting taken out for lunch by the FD, and he was like, we're going to Le Bernardin. <laughs> and th the first thing he does when he sits down is like, you, we should have like the multi-course tasting menu, right? And this is the first time ever that the FT has kind of blanched a bit and gone <laughs> and done a bit of mental arithmetic and been like, this is going to cost well into quadruple digits for lunch. <laughs> And she kind of like blanches a bit and he's like, okay, that's fine. We'll just do the regular three-course me menu instead, which even that one came to $527 for the two that's of them. That's a lot for lunch. Which is a lot for lunch. Yeah, more but, than sweet green. But it's less than half of what she would have paid if he'd done. <laughs> when, and honestly, she should have just said, of course we're doing the tasting menu because that's the point, right? Lean into it. If you if you get the opportunity, like when else are you going to have a multi-course tasting menu for lunch? I don't have an impulse to pick the most expensive place when someone offers to take me out. Agree. Unless they're like, <laughs> the opposite. Like, I, 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 like, yeah. But it's not, it's not a somewhat, it's not like this is her money. This is like Nikkei's money. I, 
Yeah. I, I just, I, as a human, that's just not my impulse, Felix. Like, I'm, like if someone's taking me out to lunch or dinner, I'm not going to order the most expensive thing on the menu. That's just like, that's what, what I was taught. I completely agree. We were taught that. <laughs> I was taught that. Americans were. I don't know. I mean, again, it it depends on who's paying and like whether it's going to cause any hardship to someone. But if the whole point is to try and rack up the bill, then try and rack up the bill. Come on. But I mean, I guess FT is doing okay, so it's fine. FT is doing. I mean, the FT can afford it. All right, Anna, bring us home. What's your number? Okay, so my number is 37. And this number fits in with one of our topics in that I have not been at Slate Money for the past two years. So the we miss you. T- I miss you guys. So the two years in which Michigan finally beat Ohio State, Yay! I was not here to be able to use the score <laughs> as my number. <laughs> so it's 37 is the combined score of Michigan over those two years. Is the combined score of how much we have beaten Ohio State in those two years. <laughs> 37 points. You've been saving that up for a while. Wow. A long time. So many points. Lots well, well done, well done, Michigan. Congratulations and commiserations to the poor people from Ohio. We, if you are listeners, went to Ohio State. We we distance ourselves from Anna's opinion. <laughs> uh, we love you. <laughs> um, okay, I th- we are going to talk about football coaches in Slate Plus, but otherwise, thanks very much for listening. Thanks to Merritt and Patrick for doing all of the amazing production work, mostly. Thanks to Anna Shemansky for turning up. It's been absolutely wonderful having you here. Come back anytime. And yeah, we'll be back next week with even more Slate Money. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.